This is Wellness by Designs. I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. We're welcoming back today, Dr. Daniel Yazbek, a chiropractor who has a holistic approach to helping patients with migraine and pain. Welcome back to Wellness by Designs. Daniel, how are you going? Very well, thank you. Great, glad to be back. Great to be talking with you again. Now, before we delve into how you help your patients with migraine and pain, um, pain is such a big topic, but can we first maybe do a little sidestep to migraine and headaches and do a little bit of a differential diagnosis to tease the different types apart? Sure. Well, Migraine is, is actually classified as a disease state and not, not many people realize that. So with regard to migraine, there are a multitude of neurologic and metabolic abnormalities that happen within the brain. So with migraine, you find that they patients who suffer migraine have extreme uh, chemical and food sensitivities. Uh, they have, they're at risk of suffering cervicogenic headaches. So most people with migraines are at, a, are at a higher risk of suffering cervicogenic headaches, whereas those with cervicogenic headaches um, don't really tend to suffer migraines because migraines is more of an inher inheritable genetic disease. So cervicogenic headache would be, is pain in the head or face that is a result of a nociceptive import, irritation, inflammation, uh, arising from the neck. And classically what you'd see is changes in active range of motion of the neck um, or if a clinician was to palpate a patient with cervicogenic headache along the structures of the neck, that would give rise to referred pain into the head, around the eyes, um, symptoms like that. Whereas in migraine, 20% of patients will tend to experience migraine with aura, which involves visual, um, auditory hallucinations, tingling, numbness in the face, even to the extremities. But also they'll tend to develop photophobia, phonophobia, so extreme light and sound sensitivity um, prior to the migraine or tackle during the migraine attack. So they're the key differential uh, symptoms between cervicogenic headache and migraine. But those with migraine ha have high susceptibility to having experiencing a cervicogenic headache because the increased sensitivity in the trigeminal vascular system uh, or the spinal trigeminal nucleus that sits in the lower brainstem becomes very sensitized. And the information arising from the neck also synapses into that area. And therefore, if there's a minor subluxation or joint derangement in the neck, migraineurs will tend to experience more frequent cervicogenic headaches. But those with cervicogenic headaches don't necessarily experience migraines because migraines are more of an inheritable genetic uh, disease. And, and we've also got like cluster headaches. I mean, you can go off on so many tangents here. There's, uh, yes. Um, yes. you know, in children they've noticed, uh, they've noted abdominal migraines. I don't even yes. know how to approach that one. Um, so <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> um, yes. Can, can I just ask before we move on, the cervicogenic headaches, are those the ones that when you're talking about pressure at the rear of the head having orbital uh, pain, presenting an orbital pain, is this where you basically palpate around the base of the skull from the rear, from the occiput, round towards your ears? And there's that sort of the bottom of the mastoid process around there. Is that it? Or yes, are you talking yeah. about the actual backbone? Well, classically, cervicogenic headache, the referral, the source of pain is referred is referred from classically in 70% of patients, C2, C3 regions. So classically, 70% of your patients with cervicogenic headache will have a biomechanical dysfunction, derangement, osteoarthritis, irritation to the capsule and the associated passive structures somewhere in between C2 to C3. Whereas higher up in the occipital, uh, occipital mastoid region, uh, you'd find that um, you can get biomechanical, biomechanical conversations up in the occipital areas uh, where the mastoid uh, 
is C0C1. And generally the compensations can also give rise to like a secondary hyperalgesic response as well. So it's not a classic uh, technical situation where it's just C2, C3 palpable tenderness. It can also spread into the, into the areas of the upper neck as well especially where you have that sternocleid and mastoid attachment into the, uh, into the mastoid. So um, classically, you'll find also those areas can be quite tender as well. Gotcha. And are these the patients that tend to have that uh, tenderness down the side of the neck, top of the clavicle, that sort of front of yeah, the that collarbone, makes... that sort of issue? Yeah, so they have the overlying muscle uh, hypertonicity and hyperalgesic response. So hyperalgesic response meaning that, a, for example, the use of a pinwheel, which tests more your spinothalamic pain pathways, they almost feel as if that's more of like a knife-like sensation. So that's that hyperalgesic response. And you'll tend to feel a lot of these patients in the SEM, scalene, subclavius, and uh, even suboccipitals, they'll develop uh, quite ex uh, exquisite uh, hypersensitivity with palpation in those areas. So, and um, and there is a big biomechanical influence as well. I hate the word you're using, exquisite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get back onto migraine because that's really the focus yeah. of our talk. But I think just yeah. just answering that belies yeah. just how complex this issue of pain, and that's just only in the head that's let alone yes. neuropathic pain and, and all the arthralgias and things like that. So let's talk about migraine for a tick. Um, can you take us through the patho pathophysiology of migraine? Because there's a biphasic response there, right? Yeah. So essentially we have, we have like a prodrome and aura migraine attack, and then you have the uh, postrome. So essentially what happens is there's some particular type of trigger. And the trigger could be a particular food antigen. It could be a chemical sensitivity. Um, there could be many stress, things like that. And basically what happens is you have a reduction in cerebral ATP, oxygenation as a result. Um, and you get essentially what happens is uh, oxidative stress, inflammation. And then what you have is the phenomenon called a cortical uh, spreading depression. And that cortical spreading depression usually arises from the occipital lobe and then it continues all the way down in through the brainstem areas. And then essentially what happens is the trigeminal vascular system, so the trigeminal, spinal trigeminal nucleus, uh, releases uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide and substance P, which then travels through the um, uh, the vasculature of the head and neck and the vasculature is innervated by cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, and that in itself sets up a sterile inflammatory response. And essentially that's where they, that's where most of their perceptions originate from the perception of pain and the throbbing, uh, throbbing or pulsatile headache. Um, so generally that's, you know, in the most general sense, that's the pathophysiology uh, of, of migraine. And essentially what can happen over time with, with chronic migraine is, is that prolonged cortical spreading depression is very much, so if, if they don't have good bioavailability um, or energy substrate or ATP for many reasons, the cortical spreading depression lasts longer. And over years, the, they become chronic migrainers. But then having said that, what happens is the periaqueductal gray in the midbrain, which is the area that helps Descend, uh, descend down into the cord to inhibit incoming pain signals, there becomes an increase in iron deposition into the paraqueductal gray. Now, I question whether opioids, which is used as, as a means of um, inhibiting pain, it can't target the paraqueductal gray because the iron deposition and the pathology surrounding that structure. And so you find a lot of people will develop an inability to descend um, descend uh, in, to be able to inhibit pain because their descending influences have been somewhat lost as a result. Um, right. So their top-down modulation of pain becomes really, really affected over time, and so and so that becomes a it becomes a big problem. But what's interesting is that if those just prior to the migraine, the cerebral ATP stores must be maintained for the resolution of migraine to occur. And so what happens is insulin resistance is pretty much um, 
occurs in all other tissues other than the brain. So you have your GLUT1 receptors, which is where insulin bias to in the brain, and it ensures that there's increased intracellular lipolysis and ketogenesis to be able to make sure that there's increased ATP and energy substrate availability to ensure that the cortical spreading depression occurs and is resolved. And so essentially that's something between migraine, migraine attacks, we need to optimize and really consider the, uh, the person as a whole uh, from a functional medicine perspective, which during the time which when they suffer the migraine attack, migraine attack the, the phase of which the cortical spreading depression uh, and the prodrome won't be as long lasting. But you can never truly stop the migraine attack from itself from actually happening. Right. Right. Um, just talking about that pathophysiology for a sec. So when we're talking about a breakdown in mitochondrial energy, if we're thinking about mm. the um, electron transfer chain, iron is integral in the first section of yes. it, like yeah. it, uh, complex one, two, three or something. Um, yeah. So if we're talking about a deposition of iron in those neural tissues, are we talking about damaged mitochondria and the iron leaking yes. about, or are we talking about, ah, okay. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, there's definitely increased mitochondrial reactive oxygen species as a result. So essentially over time you can get um, mitochondrial dysfunction as a result from, as you mentioned, the superoxide um, states as a result from iron deposition in the midbrain. So that's something to be really, really considerate of. Uh, and I know a lot of people tend to want to supplement with nitric oxide uh, synthase to induce more vasodilation, but the concept of migraine is, is, not, a, is it's not a vasoconstrictive disorder or disease. So uh, it's really, really important to understand that the vascular insufficiency is, has been for long now rejected as the etiology of migraine. Ah, and so, so my, they there found you go. So I'm way out of date. <laughs> No, it's okay. Yeah, no, and so what nitric, what nitric oxide actually does, it actually inhibits cytochrome C, I think, oxidase 4 subunit in the mitochondria, and that in itself can also perpetuate the migraine cycle too. And I can actually show, I can actually share with you that paper to be able to put on the website for those oh, who yeah. are interested in reading as well. Yeah. Please. So, so, so is there something yeah. wrong with the first few complexes? Is is that where the de sort of damage or the fragility is in the mitochondria? Yeah, I, I'm not too sure. It's it's getting pretty deep. Um, it's something for me to look into. Or it's something that I think could, you know you know there might be defective mitochondrial genes or people with uh, SNPs um, that could certainly be yeah. looked upon. And I'm, and I'm sure that's something that's of great value and depth because there are things we can do to support mitochondrial health, which would be very very useful to look into so but it's it's really interesting like i was thinking my first thought when you mm. mentioned iron deposition was oh mm. can we use say zinc as an antagonist to iron but then i was thinking hang yes. on if that's not the cause really you're just chasing your tail and there's more iron being exactly. deposited all the time we've got to look at causality and helping to rejuvenate hey, tissues hey, exactly exactly so it gets really really complex and i think I think it's really important to look you know, iron is, you know, um, a precursor to dopamine and it feeds in the biopterin pathway as well. So that's, that's, that's important. But then again, is the iron being, you know, as you said, it's being deposited as a result from the pathophysiology, not from a result from if I take exogenous iron, then is that going to further worsen the scenario, things like that. So it, it gets tricky. It gets tricky. Well, Tricky indeed, because I was then thinking about, okay, if we're talking about in the biopterin pathway, because we're talking about bees and folate and things like that, methylation, is mm. this perhaps where, poor biochemistry here, is this perhaps <laughs> where, uh, you know, riboflavin comes in as a potential treatment? Definitely. And that's just been shown in the research paper that B2 or riboflavin actually <laughs> is, actually is very important in, and resolving the migraine process. So, and, and especially obviously during the, you know, you able to support the mitochondria through B2, B3, uh, that's absolutely essential. And that's one of the key, uh, the key um, areas of, of treatment that we can, that we can provide and utilize. 
Gotcha. Okay. All right. So um, when we're talking about migraine, you know, we've got to think about when patients find us or you in this case. So uh, are the patients that seek you out, the people that have been to everyone, seen everyone, tried everything, and they're just sick and tired of everything, they're the, the breakthrough migraineurs. And so you get these sort of, you know, let's say a, a biased sample of the, the failures of orthodox medicine. Um, do you get those people trickling through or do you get just normal first time sort of, not first time, but um, early yeah. treatment um, seekers? Yeah. Oh, it's certainly a combination. So you definitely have the ones who've been referred um, due to, you know, I've got, a, you know, I've been renowned as being a bit more in depth, um, a bit more integrated. So certainly you get that referral, that word of mouth. Um, and those patients come to me because they've been everywhere. And, and well, classically in my industry within the chiropractic profession, a lot of the chiropractors just look at a single source of, of the problem, which is just purely biomechanical. And, and, and if it's a neck, uh, if there's a neck source, if, if the source of the issue is lying in the neck and outside of that, there's really not much scope um, should I say, well, there's not much, I think, um, willingness to explore outside the scope. So I do find a lot of these patients and like coming to me, um, and it's not just purely a biomechanical case, you know, and that's what's led me to go down the path of functional medicine and functional neurology, because you can't, you can't separate the two. They're very, very, very intertwined. And, you know, metabolic support is huge. I mean, um, you know, for example, like, you know, for the, for, for the most part, a lot of female migraineurs uh, tend to have extreme chemical sensitivity. They have, they may have pathogenic yeast overgrowth, like pathogenic uh, candida overgrowth. And what we know about candida is that it actually hijacks the, so what, what happens is it produces acetylaldehyde. It converts pyruvate into acetylaldehyde and less pyruvate gets shunted into the mitochondria to make ATP. And if you have ATP, that's obviously less as a result, then that's going to affect um, uh, energetics as well. So that's, that's just one thing that's also really, really important. We need to look at the, at the gut, address the gut, and just overall look at the whole the whole system. Got it. So when you're talking about um, female migraineurs, and, and just a point, what I thought was interesting was there was a neurologist based in south sydney um yes. st george area uh who um correct me if i'm wrong but he was so sick and tired of um having disgruntled patients not getting complete resolution or near complete resolution of their migraines that that's what drove him to to source or to look yeah. into uh, functional medicine, integrative medicine as a means yeah. to just nip off the bud. He didn't swap over. He was using it in combination with um, medicines, but uh, pharmaceutical medicines. But there was quite a substantial group of patients that were just not satisfied with the reduction in migraines that they were getting. So it's really interesting about this movement, even of quite orthodox neurologists, to investigate mm. herbs and nutrients in helping migraineurs. Oh, certainly. I mean, especially when a lot of the neurologic cases, a lot of the cases that I present to a neuro neurologist, they're not classic textbook neurology cases you'd find, um, you know, <laughs> during med school. I mean, hmm. for the odd occasion of the one who presents with a space occupying lesion or tumor, or uh, they might have, um, say, for example, uh, you know, herpes simplex virus, you know, innovating a trigeminal nerve, you know, they have it's not typical. These are very atypical uh, cases that they present with. And I've actually been dealing with a patient at the moment who has celiac disease, yet presents with a orthostatic tremor and a whole host of other neurologic type symptoms. And, and you, you really got to address the, the energetics. You got to look at the, um, uh, you got to address the gut. You just got to eliminate the total inflammatory burden um, and right. I think that's really, really important. I think there's a really big push into the integrated functional medicine aspect because how I look at it is if, you know, the vagus nerve is 80% afferent and, you know, you know, we have alpha synuclein, um, you know, released into the vagus nerve that transfers up into the, you know, brainstem and, and cortical related areas. And you have, that's where you have your Parkinsonism and your, 
you know, your, um, your various other types of um, movement disorder pathologies that can result from perhaps, perhaps maybe a longstanding uh, gastrointestinal problem. I mean, we don't know, but it's definitely something where, the, the, you know, I think the research is quite clear. It's, it's now heading into, you know, investigating um, potential pathogenic species in the gut and the effects of which are going to cause long-term in, in the presence of intestinal permeability and in various other uh, other factors. And so that's certainly not to be overlooked. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. are there any key considerations that we have to be aware of with, I guess, especially female migraineurs? They do suffer yeah. migraines more than men, but it's not restricted to only women, obviously. Yeah, I think I think the young female, um, you know, 30 to 35, especially on the contraceptive pill, um, those who have benign high permeability or a collagen, um, uh, sort of abnormal, sorry, for example, like a collagen disorder, Erlos Danlos, and, mm. and, and many of the others. Yeah. So if your structural support system is not good and you're on the pill and you may have elevated homocysteine levels, um, then, then you put all those three together and it's like you need to, you know, need to consider whether you believe that a manipulative technique is necessary at that particular time. And so I think that's really, really important to, to, um, to address. What I'm picking up here is that we're really talking about an almost metabolic fragility here. You know, you've got yes. genes, then you've got, um, you know, potential gut issues, potential gluten sensitivity. So you've got SNPs related to that as well. La, la, la. So we're going all around here. Yeah. What about, forgive me, including the hormones no. as well and um, not just looking at the OCP yes. but potentially things like um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, do you have a PMS, uh, things like that? Yeah, 100%. So they've even shown, shown that two to five days after the menses that if your estrogen levels are significantly reduced, that's also a risk factor for migraine or the increase in, in frequency of migraine attacks. Um, so that's really, really important, especially women with estrogen dominant syndromes, even, um, you know, estrogen on progesterone can be quite neuroprotective. So that's some, that's an avenue, uh, that where you, you need to kind of look into. Um, and I guess even, even hypo cortisol state, so very low cortisol. So if you have very low cortisol, that's going to be a potential drive in chronic unresolving inflammation mm. and so that's a yeah. really important step and especially and it's been shown that you know having low very low cortisol uh, essentially can upregulate nf kappa beta which can derive someone with autoimmunity uh, or pre-existing autoimmune disease and in pretty much causing a flare-up so we need to address cortisol and various other um, hormones as well i think that's very very important very, very important. Right. Yeah. So obviously, the, obviously, those low cortisol people, they're sort of, you know, on their last legs. They've, they've been through the yes. high cortisol and they're, they're worn yes. out. But, um, what, what, I mean, we need to really address this uh, and I'll cover what supplements you use and you find of merit later. But but in the meantime, things like assessments, um, do you do any, You forgive me, you were mentioning before, you were showing us on the video, forgive our listeners, but you're going to miss out on this, and you were showing us basically where you're palpating for the cervicogenic type headaches. Um, what sort of other physical assessments can tell us or give us clues about um, metabolic fragility, for instance? Yeah, sure. So one thing you can do is you can use um, your ophthalmoscope if you have one in the practice and just shine... Um, obviously dial down the intensity if they're during the migraine or prior or between migratory episodes. So you don't want to get them in and, 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 and be able to perform an extensive evaluation once we have the migraine attack, but <laughs> you'd shine the light into their eye at a very low intensity and see how the latency in their papillary constriction and whether it holds or not and to which extent, how long after it holds, does it redilate? So, we know that with increased sympathetic stress, they have a, an increase in catecholamine response, nor epinephrine that can sensitize um, the pain response. The, the, the pain response, and so it's one thing to look at or to gauge papillary uh, dilation. Um, if if the pupil constricts 
at a very, very, if the latency is very, 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 very minimal and it constricts only a tiny bit and then redilates, they have increased fatigue ability potentially. You have to look at other things as well, but it's potentially an increased fatigable response in that they, the, the midbrain is just, is just being wound up potentially. So if the yeah, midbrain is being for wound survival. Up, Exactly right. Exactly right. So that's one little thing that you can do. You can also use a um, like a neuro tip and apply it to the side of the neck while you can currently look in the pupil. Now, if the pupil dilates as a response, as, as a significant increase in, as, a, uh, as a result of the uh, pinprick, you know that there's an increase in sympathetic tone or sympathetic response because you've got the superior cervical ganglion, which increases the sympathetic response as a result from that on that um, mechanical input. So these are like little, these are two things that you can kind of utilize. Um, of course, you'd want to also, which you could, I, I mentioned this in the um, your dysautonomia um, webinar as well, is that you could place the pulse oximeter on their finger and provide a high frequency sound emitted from a tuning fork into the ears, one ear or the other, and see if it actually elevates their heart rate response. And so if wow. it does, you know that, yeah, because you have within the midbrain, you have the superior and the inferior colliculi, one that responds to like light, emitting light yeah, and auditory sound. So if they have a dysregulated midbrain that's just wound up, you're going to probably find the heart rate escalate with some sound, especially when it's high frequency sound. Or you shine the light in the eye and their heart rate jumps, jumps up. So these are the, like small, you know, things that you can do at bedside that can give you an indirect, you know, assessment as to, well, they're really wide up now. You don't want to probably treat them right now. You might have to kind of reduce the stress levels a bit and then go in and find what you think is most appropriate. So um, wow. they're, they're two things that's that really you can do at bedside. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so what about yeah. other assessments? You were mentioning uh, NF kappa B being raised. So, you, you know, do you look at things like, um, not ESR, CRP? Do you look at... Yeah, um, so um, ferritin things yeah. like that where oh yeah so we look at a complete blood count we play the differential we look at homocysteine levels um ferritins for your iron storage um your crp your esrs are very important for the acute inflammatory response um and i think it's also good to look at you know the 24-hour um uh, salivary cortisol as well I think that's that just should be a standard part of the assessment for someone who's been to every different doc and they can't resolve as to why they they have the chronicity of migraines. So I think that's um, that's really really important. Um, your B12, you know your you know um, B2, and your full iron count as well, which is really important. So standard blood labs with um, added a functional assessments on the side is uh, very much. Um, I think uh, necessary, and of course, if if you feel it's necessary, a um, to look at their methylation status as well, um, which I which I think can be quite important. Um, gotcha. So yeah, there there are quite a few things that we can do. Okay, brilliant. And yeah. so we've mentioned riboflavin. We've mentioned you know, well, forgive me. We were talking about mitochondrial um, health before, and and what was going through my mind with the complex one to three was CoQ10. Um, so. What sort of nutraceuticals and indeed herbs do you use for um, helping people to reduce migraines and when are they applicable to use? Yeah. Um, like can you take them during a migraine or is it really over a, a longer period of time to decrease the frequency yeah. and severity? I think it's over a longer period of time um, to decrease the severity and the frequency. I think between migraine attacks, if we can establish a pattern or a time period of which it happens, I think you're, the best intervention is the one between the attacks, I think. Um, but that doesn't go to say that you can't use high quality, you know, EPA or DHA during the migraine process to resolve the inflammatory cascade. Um, I like to optimize energy. So I like to use coenzyme Q10, alpha lipoic acid, resveratrol, um, high dose curcumin, ginger, so, you know, upping your phytonutrients as well. So I think you need to look at a, you know, downregulating inflammation, but also then, you know, improving mitochondrial health. So um, I think that's, that's really, really important. Magnesium citrate uh, or magnesium malate. Um, and then you could also use, 
forgot that other herb that I was going to think about. Yeah, but basically you want to look at fever fuel extract. Yeah, yeah. There's some good data on that. But, yeah, there's so a number, you know, that I've used. There's a number of them. There's a number of them. And yeah. I think I think even L-carnitine as well. I mean, especially during that process of which the cortical spreading depression is occurring where you have that migraine episode, um, it actually can, if you can, imp- if you can increase ATP generation, so lipolysis you have, or even if you look at, um, say, um, beta hydroxybutyrate, like exo- exogenous ketones, um, just anything to increase the energy bioavailability so that the frequency or the duration of the attack is potentially going to lessen. So things like that. Now, I don't know, yeah, if, like you Can have I... endogenous ketone, you have exogenous, but I really don't know if exogenous is going to make the big difference. But, um, yeah, it's just it's a consideration yeah. of thought based, yeah, based on that, yeah. So, so what dose of carnitine do you use? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I just go off the, just the prescription on the back. So if, you know, if it's powder form, I like to use one to two scoops, um, you know, three or four days. Um, if you can predict when the migraine is, if they have an aura leading up into the migraine, then I, yeah. I'd like to have at least two or, you know, two or three scoops of, of L-carnitine, um, you know, one to two times a day, three or four days before the actual before the actual migraine episode, but that depends on how long, right. how long the aura sit, aura um, yeah. lasts for, and um, everyone's really different. So yeah, so we're talking gram dosages certainly. Um, you mentioned also something before about um, forgive me something that was going to be affecting BDNF, um, and so I was thinking about, you know, the, the good things that we know positively affect BDNF and, and that was things like exercise, but sometimes yeah. strenuous exercise can bring yeah. on a migraine. So how yes. do you yeah. navigate that one? Yeah, very interesting. So, you know, so really we're exploring the concept of readiness, like when am I ready to exercise? When am I ready to move about? So I think, I think if you have, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, heart rate variability apps that you can download that can kind of gauge your readiness as to when to exercise. Um, if if weather changes are a trigger in your migraine attack, it's, you know, you, you might not want to exercise in unstable conditions. Um, but I guess it really comes down to establishing baseline physiological data and then getting a percentage of that that's not going to tip you over the edge. Um, so I, I would certainly suggest that, you know, exercise should be, you know, it shouldn't be strenuous, it shouldn't be too intense, light to moderate. Um, and obviously throughout that process, it's really important to, um, you know, induce or be able to do some biofeedback with some, you know, heart rate variability um, before and after exercise. So you can somewhat maintain uh, a suitable level of homeostasis. Gotcha. Brilliant. Um, so just one other point we were talking about with CoQ10. So do you tend to, because we're talking about mitochondrial sufficiency here, do you tend to go, you know, quite punchy doses? I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, a 1,000 milligrams, for instance, used in Parkinson's. Yeah. But do you tend to go yeah. high and heroic or low and slow? And sorry, the last question, well, not the last question, yeah. but one of the other questions was, yeah. You're also mentioning the people with low cortisol, the people that are just worn out. Do you use, you know, adaptogenic herbs there, like you know, the with oh, Annie as the astragalus, if there's fruit. immune thing. Licorice. Certainly, yeah, yep. I love, yeah, licorice fruit is, you know, um, lesser azalabra. So I, I, I certainly, there certainly has its place, definitely. So um, I like licorice fruit. I haven't really explored too much into into the others, but that's something I that that I that that I advise my patients to use. Um, gotcha. And, so, and, and with the CoQ10, high and heroic or low and no, slow? I like, I like low and slow. So I like to start with 350 to 400 milligrams and then <laughs> okay. and then work away up to quite decent. Know, seven, 750 to 1,000 maybe, really depending on, on the patient. But, um, wow, okay. Yeah. That's cool. We've got some yeah, great it, tips it, today, it really Daniel. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, now, can can I also ask? Have, have you done any webinars on this? No. 
we need to get you teaching people. <laughs> so, yeah. This I'll, is fantastic yeah. information. It really is. Oh, did you yeah, enjoy it? Gorgeous. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. I, um, Daniel, thank you so much for, yeah. for taking us through just some real nice practical tips today on helping people with migraine and pain. Pain is huge. I get it. So we didn't really go into neuropathic pain and things like sure. that. But thanks so much for taking us through headaches and, and migraine today and what we can do to help patients. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today on Wellness by Designs. You can find all the other podcasts and the show notes for this podcast on the Designs for Health website. This is Wellness by Designs and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.